probably the most delightful thing that happened. And it wasn't, wasn't about me, but it was my publisher asked me to edit David Bentley Hart's uh, novel, Kino Gaia, which wow. was, which was great fun to do. I mean, I love, I've edited a couple of David's books, but this was a lot of fun because it was spiritually profound, but also some enjoyable escapism. And as I kept reading through it, I kept saying, this is the kind of thing my kids should read. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to check that out. I didn't know he was working on that. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, cool. It's it. a cool book. I'm about halfway through his, um, I'm drawing a blank, but the, the Dog by Moonlight um, series of reflections Roland. that he wrote. Roland. Yeah, there we go. Roland. Yeah. Oh, Roland. Hey, Which is, hey, friends. That's a lot. Let's laugh out loud funny in some parts. It is. It's just, uh, it's nothing like that well hey everybody and welcome to uh, the show today it's uh we are joined by michael martin welcome michael it's good to have you with us it's nice to be here thanks for asking me michael is a philosopher a poet musician songwriter editor and a biodynamic farmer he's taught at a university level for 17 years he's written multiple books i think i've only read like half of them uh multiple times they're just they're wonderful. It's a rare treat for me to spend a few minutes here with you, Michael. Um, Thanks. For the show, it's called uh, Smart Catholics Mastermind. It's about meeting the minds and hearts of Catholic creators. They devote their time and talent to mastering their journey and vocation so that normal people like you and I can live fuller lives faster, maybe get a little smarter. I'd love to ask you, Michael, a bit about uh, your background and uh, kind of the origin story. How did you get to where you are now? Well, I don't know where I am, but uh, um, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, a series of uh, strange circumstances. My wife and I have been married for 30 years. And uh, when I met her, um, I had just started, uh, I was, a, or, well, when I married her, I just started uh, as a Waldorf teacher. Mm -hmm. And I was... Also, I had a, a landscaping business. I did garden design, and we lived in the city at the time. Um, but over the over time, and, you know, I got more and more interested in philosophy and into the intellectual life. Uh, but all at the same time, being really committed to practical work and farming and gardening, and we have nine children, so so that kind of grounded in that way. Um, but then I was a Waldorf teacher for 16 years. Then I, um, maybe the last five or six years I was doing that, I was also teaching at night at a college. And then I became a full-time professor after I left being a Waldorf teacher. My doctorate is in uh, early modern English literature and specializing in, in religious literature. So kind of know a lot, of, a lot about um Protestant mysticism and what happened when I was going when I was doing my dissertation I was reading about uh reading everything I could about Thomas and Henry Vaughan Henry Vaughan the metaphysical poet and Jane Led who was part of this group called the Philadelphian Society mm -hmm. and they were all inspired by uh the Lutheran mystic Jakob Burma mm -hmm. and they had this interesting uh, take and especially Jane Led and John Portage of the Philadelphian Society, they they had these kind of mystical experiences of the divine Sophia, mm -hmm. who kind of who spoke to them like in in more in Catholic idioms, you know, like Bernadette or the children of Fatima speak to the Virgin Mary. And I was kind of fascinated by this, and I had read about this before, I think in my twenties, early thirties, uh, about through uh, Vladimir Soloviev, the Russian mystic and philosopher. So and I remember reading that. And I think he even had a note in my dissertation and saying, someone should write a book about this. And it ended up being me, which is what I did with <laughs> the submerged reality. I wrote a book about that. And so that's intellectually, I mean, what, what was wonderful about that is um, what I found through especially Henry Vaughn, I remember reading him and his poetry is really imbued with nature and scripture and it's very, very mystical, but very grounded. 
And I, I remember thinking, well, this is my spirituality right here. This is what I do. <laughs> Finally have, a, have a, a context for the way I approach the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of been doing that ever since. Uh, it's been a hair at our farm. It's, we're a biodynamic or organic farm. So we're kind of very mindful of the presence of God in creation. And the way we, the way we treat our animals and our plants. That's beautiful. Um, and again, listening to your, your podcast, what's the name of the podcast? It's now, I think you're 10 episodes in, is that right? I don't know how many in, but, but the regeneration podcast is what is it with my friend, Mike Sauter. Yeah. Yeah. And so you now run the center for, uh, sociological studies. Mm -hmm, I do. And what's, I was curious to ask, um, for those who have no familiarity with um, Sophia and this research and so on, uh, I guess one question is: she has uh, continued to be to be revered in the East as a, and a tradition that's been lost in the West. And do you have a, a overview of why it was something that was so lost in the West but preserved in other areas? Well, I don't think she's too revered in the East either, um, but. And like I said, what I think happened with this idea of what I'm calling sophiology. Um, so when I started into it, I kind of jumped in at the 16th and 17th century in my scholarly work. And it starts there with a kind of Protestant mysticism, as I was just alluding to. Mm -hmm. from, from there, it kind of migrates east and goes to Russia. And then in the 18th century or 19th century, I should say, Vladimir Soloviev picks up on it, and then he inspires all these other theologians and philosophers in the Russian Silver Age, and they start picking up this idea. And then it goes from the from goes from Germany, basically, it goes a little bit to England, then it then it heads to Russia, then it comes back from Russia, back to the West, where it influences. Uh, Thomas Merton and Hans Urs von Balthasar and Louis Boyer and other people, or, uh, what's his name, uh, Henri de Lubac. So it kind of comes back to the West. Now here's, now that's where I was with my research. I was, I was kind of, that was the trajectory I was tracing. Um, and it's, and that's why I called the, the book, The Submerged Reality. Because as far as I'm concerned, so sophiology is a reality that's submerged. You know, it's under it's under the water, underground in the West and and in the East too. There's a lot of hostility toward it in uh, mm -hmm. in Russia in particular. Um, but then I ran into the work of Margaret Barker, who is a Methodist preacher and scholar. She knows she knows all the the biblical languages, mm -hmm. and she her her big argument is that the the veneration of divine wisdom was present in first temple Judaism. Mm -hmm. And you can see that, I mean, there are traces of it in, in the old Testament. Um, the most obvious one is Proverbs eight. When God, when Sophia or wisdom, um, assists God in the creation, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I was with him in the beginning before all things. And then, and it's also in, uh, uh, the Book of Wisdom and the Sirach as well, and but some, but also in uh, Genesis, if we think about uh, the creation of of Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. when God says, "Let us make man in our image," well, well, I always took that as God talking. You know, well, the Jewish tradition would just use the royal we, but mm -hmm. in the the Christian tradition, it's the Trinity. But then I read a book um, by actually, uh, he had been a Catholic Benedictine, I think he's Belgian, and then he converted to Orthodoxy. And this, and this is in the 1920s or 30s. Uh, Alexander Musbrugge, I think his name is. And he argued in that book that when God says, let us make man in our image, that he was speaking to Sophia. Because what comes up after that? Mm -hmm. So... Male and female created he them, <laughs> right? Right. right? Which seem which seem to uh, offer a, a long overdue correction to our 
um, our metaphysics, really. Yeah. At the risk of not derailing the conversation, but just wanting to chat with you about all of that. You know, you've put me on to Margaret Barker. I had a an hour long conversation with, uh, I think you might have met him, maybe uh, Dustin Quick. Uh, we chatted about. Um, I do know. Fantastic. Yeah, he's we had another interview with him on, on the same channel. Um, could you speak to, uh, you know, I've spoken with a couple of people and sharing your books with them and so on. And of course, you get the immediate you know, lack of context or familiarity with this. So I, two questions I have. One is how to respond to uh, when folk fear it is a, a purely a Gnostic thing, Gnostic in a, a negative <laughs> sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then why is it important? And now maybe just an academic exercise. Um, yeah. Where would you go with that? Well, um, I think, you know, people, like that word Gnostic scares people off. It's, in fact, the subtitle of David Hart's book, uh, Kino Guy, is a Gnostic tale. And I was recommending to him to take it off there because I thought it was going to scare off some Catholic homeschool parents because I thought, like, my youngest two are 11 and 13. And I, and I kept reading it thinking, these boys will love this book. But uh, he didn't want to take it off. <laughs> so for, in my own case, you know, I knew that was going to happen. In fact, when I in, when I first words in, in the submerged reality, I let us start a war because I, I expected to get attacked from we could call it the Catholic right on this. And there I have been attacked by the Catholic right on this. But I got actually most of the attacks I've had from the Catholic left. Oh really? The Christian left. Oh yeah, they because I I take a kind of a you know, rational approach to, you know, all the hot button issues of our day, like abortion or same sex marriage and stuff like that. And they, they were not cool with that. So I'm a homophobe and I hate women. Uh, but for those who would, uh, would be worried about Gnosticism, I, I mean, I don't, I, all I, and I'm a very practical person. So when I was reading this stuff, I'm thinking, you know, this is what's been missing. This mm -hmm. is this is this is a reality. This is not only is this a theological truth. It's also um, a metaphysical reality. Mm -hmm. And the way I, you know, I I kind of came at it um, out of the phenomenological tradition. And in phenomenology, the idea is you. <clears throat> You behold phenomena. You, you you stand before phenomena and let it speak. You don't try to impose your own context onto it. You just mm -hmm. shut up and get. You, it's called the epoche, where you push everything out of the way and just observe what's there and just and let it speak. And I think when this happens, people have um, can and doesn't always happen, but people can have uh, experiences that are i get they probably border on mystical because mm -hmm. you are you, you you have you have an understanding it what, what com comes with this not trying to understand it comes another kind of understanding mm -hmm. and i think for for me the, yeah, one of the one of the aspects of sociology that i'm interested in is how it is when we attend to phenomena and it could be things in nature it could be the arts it could be poetry, could be liturgy, could be scripture, but you have those experiences. If you if you went gone through this thing hundreds of times, whether maybe it's liturgy, maybe it's this passage in scripture, but that one time where you're kind of disarmed, it opens up before you, mm -hmm. right? And I think in that, to me, and in fact, I was just reading yesterday, you know, supposed to give a lecture on. Pavel Florensky was a Russian, Russian sociologist and priest in September. And uh, I was reading his, his uh, passage on Sophia in his book, The Pillar and Ground of the Truth. And he, he's saying the same thing. He's saying, the same, you know, and what happens, you get through doing that and say it's you, say you're reading Proverbs 8. Well, you could read Proverbs 8 knowing that some of the fathers said that wisdom is really Christ. 
But if you read Proverbs 8 just as it is, then you give, and this is what happened to me. I said, like, wow, well, maybe this is something other than I was thinking. And then what happens, so if you see Sophia or wisdom in Proverbs 8 is the handmaid of God, literally, right? The Ancile Domini, which means personal slave, right? They didn't, they didn't have servants in the ancient world. They had slaves, right? And then you get to Luke the gospel of saint luke and when when gabriel greets mary what does she say behold the handmaid of the lord and it was the opinion of burma and other people in in florensky that actually the virgin mary is the incarnation of sophia and that mm -hmm. that's the example and of course you know people and, and you can you could extend that to the immaculate conception but but also to the assumption because this is this is a being of a <laughs> of a very different quality than any being mm -hmm. you know yeah in the... but and, and and like in in proverbs where sophia is kind of the, the metaxu which is a philosoph philosophical term meaning the middle the between or you could say catalyst mm -hmm. that allows that god creates through sophia mm -hmm. Just like in, in in Luke, God recreates the world through Mary, mm -hmm. right? Behold, yeah. I make all things new. In, invites her uh, receptivity to weave the, uh, as Margaret Barker, I think, will say, the garments of flesh for the Christ. And yeah. so creation is the, the same thing. Creation herself, or known as Sophia, uh, he enters into that same... Uh, invitation to her receptivity. Isn't she referred to, or she's painted as like an archangel, maybe the first um, created being that participates in divinity the same way that we are right. also called into that same state of theosis, uh, invited into right. that. But she was the first, that first angel, that first being. And... Um, uh, like for instance, for, so Florensky and Sergei Bulgakov, another Russian priest, sociologist, probably the more formidable of all of them, because he can turn sociology into a kind of a systematic theology. Um, they both suggest, and, and they got this from Vladimir Slavik, that, that Sophia slash Mary is in a way the fourth hypostasis, right? There's the Trinity and there's... Because Sophie is like, I, I think of it as like, you know, the Holy Grail or, the, or this vessel that is able to hold the Trinity. I mean, quite literally, right? Quite literally. Mm -hmm. You know? It embodies it. Like, or think it brings of, it. Oh, well, yeah. It, yeah. Gives it body. Mm -hmm. Takes, I mean, you know that line from Dante, virgin mother, daughter of thy son, right? Predestined turning point of God's intention, right? Thy merit, so ennobled human human a human race i can't remember how the rest of it goes but but i mean quite literally she's the mother of she virgin mother daughter of thy son mm -hmm. right i mean talk about trinitarian theology right? that's why they always really let deacons incredible. Pre preach that's why they let deacons preach on the feast of, of the trinity mm -hmm. <laughs> well, i'll let you do it because it's impossible to do in, in between the, the work that you've done and your, your parsing of these mystics and, um, you know, uh, pointing us towards people like Margaret Barker, what I found just mind-blowing for me growing up uh, as a cradle Catholic and then coming into contact with this, and I think you've either said it or other people have said it, the church doesn't know what to do with mystics. They don't color inside the lines. They maybe don't recognize that there are lines, um, but they have mm -hmm. this incredibly vital role. Uh, to play in the church, human development, the embodiment of Christ in the world, and so on, and to learn from them uh, in the way that you've, you know, packaged them for us. I, you, I now see Mary everywhere, Our Lady everywhere, and not having this is—it's such a sad, saddened, and impoverished, um, yeah, Christianity. But it's all there again, like you say, submerged. It's all present but it's not it's not repressed it's just ignored or just ignored. yeah 
Yeah, and and you know, I I don't know about you, but I I, I suffered through enough Catholic school to uh, recall that I mean, I was interested in this kind of stuff. And when I was a boy, I remember watching, remember the film, the Song of Bernadette. Mm -hmm. It's a great film. It's still a great film. Or uh, I can't remember The Miracle at Fatima, which is not as good as The Song of Bernadette. It's like a, a kind of a B-grade version of The Song of Bernadette. But but I was really, as a kid, enthralled by this, like, that the Virgin Mary can talk to people? Really? Can it happen to me? Can it happen to you? I mean, does that happen? How does that go? Right? Or, or Joan of Arc, right? I was inspired by that story with St. Michael appearing to, to Joan of Arc. I'm like, I, I, I loved the, the reluctant saint kid. growing up. Yeah. We never, I never saw that one. Oh, really? The one by oh, my, my favorite. Yes. I didn't see that till I was, gosh, in my 30s or 40s. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I just, I was interested that that, that could happen. And I would ask questions in catechism class, and you no, know, get turned back to the Baltimore catechism, you know, stuff, right, right. which I think has turned more people off the Catholic Church than just about anything. The Baltimore mm -hmm. catechism, oh God, help us! In fact, here's my little aside: we had a copy of the same Baltimore catechism that I used. It was like the children's version, which I had as one of my my school books when I was a kid. And I mm -hmm. went upstairs at our house, or this own farmhouse. And my daughter, who's now 18, she must have been nine, seven or eight or nine. And she was bawling her eyes out. What's the matter? Because I was reading this book, and I'm such a sinner. I'm never going to go to heaven. What book What book were you reading? And she showed me. I said, we're throwing, I'm throwing this thing out. This uh -huh. is damaging the children. And that's the point. To your point, you were saying it was all submerged. And, you know, being a father and having the responsibility of transmitting a life of faith to my children. Yes. I didn't want to be that one, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I, I mean, unless you come into the, you know, unless you become as one of these, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes. You know, and so how can, how do we do that? I mean, how do we show the children the glory mm -hmm. of the Lord, right? It's Which this, is this... another term for Sophia. Well, there you go. There you go. I, yeah. Um, I was fortunate, to, like I said, to see that one, The Reluctant Saint and Story of Bernadette, Song of Fatima and so on. Uh, There's another one, um, Marcelino Panivino, a little boy who would bring bread and wine to uh, a big life-size crucifix up in the attic. And, and the Christ would speak to this little boy. And um, oh, that sense of that lovely little Italian film from, I don't know, 30s mm -hmm. or 40s or something. But that sense of, like you said, nature not being a closed book but an open book and God continuing to communicate. I would grapple because I loved reading the old Testament. Why are there no more miracles? And then to begin mm -hmm. to realize, Oh, there are, they don't get the airtime. We don't like to talk about them because <laughs> we don't know what to do with them. Yeah. Uh, but this is what your, why your work has been so enriching and fascinating and, and rewarding, spiritually rewarding. Uh, for me, I hope more people continue to discover you. And you have uh, not only a podcast, you also have a, a magazine that you put out. Is it quarterly? Jesus, the imagination. It's, it's annual. And annual. it's annual. Okay. Jesus, the imagination. Yeah. And, and our, what's, what is that? The latest. overview on that one? Well, um, it's, it's a different theme every year. The theme we have one that will come out probably in a month or so. And the theme for this one is flesh and spirit. Last year's was the divine feminine, but I, I thought, you know, when I founded it, I said, boy, the, 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 the Catholic arts are pretty much dead, <laughs> you know, you know, because you either see, you know, kind of rehashed mannerist or Renaissance art, or this kind of horrible formalist verse that, you know, everybody's going to write a sonnet and here comes another sonnet. And I have had a lot of sonnets sent to me. But I wanted something with kind of artistic integrity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and daring and originality. I mean, if you look back, you know, when Pl Paul Claudel was writing, for instance, I mean, what an amazing poet. Even T.S. Eliot, right? T.S. Eliot, you know, who was the high modernist and a high Anglo Catholic at the same time. And, and, and where is that? I mean, that was the cutting edge in the, say, the 30s and 40s was led by, by those kinds of poets, 
-hmm. you know, Brother Antoninus, the last one. You know, he's no longer read too much, but man, he was fantastic. And so I wanted to do one of those. I don't know if I'm, I'm successful, but that was that's the that's the intention. Like that sense of raising the bastions, taking down the walls to let let life out and also be enriched by all of that. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the point about you know raising our children and so on. I'm from a family of eight. I have a little one, and it it's something I'm very sensitive to. Is this sense of uh, what has been taught isn't necessarily a, you know been done in the well intended. Maybe it's not. It doesn't work anymore. Isn't as good as we thought it was. And my friend uh, Paul Fahey and I we run a a weekly podcast called Pope Francis Generation to very much dig into that. What are the core things that should be, you know, spining our catechisms uh, and, and what we model to our little ones? Well, what, what, to me anyway, it's that we don't have a culture that can hold them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look, you know, I, I'm, I'm a 17th century scholar. So one of my favorite writers is Robert Herrick, the Anglican priest and poet, but we don't have festivals. We have church. Yes, we have liturgies, which and if you're a kid, you remember going to liturgy when you were a kid, you're like, OK, how long is this going to last again? You know, do we have a, a, a Christian Catholic culture outside of, of Sunday morning that can hold them? Right. And so what we do at our farm, we, we celebrate uh, festivals, we have May Day, we, we have J St. John's Day with jumping over the fire and stuff. Wow. Uh, so we throw in all this conviviality. We, we celebrate Michaelmas in September mm -hmm. as a harvest festival. And some of these things, especially during COVID, you know, when the world was shut down, I don't know how word got out about our May Day festival, but suddenly about 50 people showed up. I didn't even know them. And they had their kids. Is this where the festival is? We were starving, <laughs> you know, come on in, right? So, I mean, I, that's what we don't have. And that's what we try to cultivate mm -hmm. in our own experience of the world. You know, if, you were to, if you were to select a book to leave us with, um, what would you highlight? And would it, would it be the notes towards that reimagining of, of everything? Transfiguration, uh, oh, I think it was. Transfiguration? Well, that's... So... If I look at those, like I have like these three books that are kind of a, a trilogy, a sociological trilogy, not on purpose, um, mm -hmm. but it worked out that way. It's, so the submerged reality kind of lays out a, a, a cultural history of sociology, mm -hmm. kind of gives you the big picture and sees how it moved from Germany to Russia to the West again. Uh, so that that does that. The transfiguration I think of as kind of a practical sociology so it's there are chapters on how we could reimagine education or e economics or arts or whatever it is right so mm -hmm. there's that and then my last book on the topic which is sophia in exile is more of a it's not poetry but it's more poetic and mm -hmm. it's more of a uh, and even, in fact, there is some poetry in it as well. So, but it, it's a very different kind of book, but it's a kind of meditation. It's more, in a way, more mature than the other two because I had more time to think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of a more ex uh, a mature expression of where that can go. And I also put out, uh, it's called The Heavenly Country, which is a an anthology that has primary sources, poetry, and some critical essays. If people mm -hmm. want to read that. Where so can it's, people it's find like you online, ending. Martin? Yeah, we're gonna find, find you uh, on uh, at my website, the the Center for for Sociological Studies dot com, mm -hmm. and my so my blog. I haven't been posting as much on my blog as I was. Plus, we're doing doing the podcast and the podcast too, Regeneration Podcast, which is on YouTube, uh, Podbean, Spotify, and the Podchaser. I don't know if it's on Amazon yet or on Apple yet. Uh, so those those are two places you, you can check in my work and see what I'm doing. And uh, and then, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's about Good. It. Well, I, I'll include that link in the in the show notes so people can um, can find you. Um, I like to to always wrap asking people uh, to to share a one minute message with the world. Before doing that, I just want to um, thank people who did watch this episode. If you did enjoy it, please do hit the like button. Uh, and subscribe. It does help more people to hear about Michael Martin's work. 
Um, this show is brought to you by the free Catholic community on smartcatholics.com. We're free of trolls and ads and toxicity, faithful to the Holy Father, Pope Francis and the church, and committed to a culture of kindness and learning. Does that sound like you? Then come and check us out on smartcatholics.com. Uh, Michael, if you had one minute to share a message uh, to Catholics everywhere, what would you want to say to them? Well, I would say we live in, in pretty dark times. You know, it's it's not easy to live through these times, and and you know, for everybody, you know, I, I think everybody is pretty much traumatized by the what's gone on for the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. But you know be not afraid, <laughs> you know, um, I met a priest years ago who said, and I think it's, it's good advice. Radical trust produces radical consequences. So try to remember wow. that.